Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul, where I send my Twitch livestream audience to their preferred destination, providing that they pay with the in-stream currency struts, which they earn by watching. Here you can see me modifying a GSLV Mark III from India with a Vulcan core. Uh, this is the Vulcan, ULA Vulcan, of course. And then adding four of the SRBs from GSLV Mark III to it. Normally the GSLV Mark III would only have two boosters. And the reason I am doing this is because I wanted to get the Gagayan spacecraft to the moon. Normally the GSLV Mark III would not be able to do that, but with a little bit of modification, as you can see, uh, we can get it done. Uh, basically with a more efficient core and more of an initial boost. Uh, unfortunately, the core stage of the GSLV Mark III is not very efficient. It still uses the old Vickus engines, which are, uh, well, they could do with some work. Anyway, so here we go. Though, then again, the BE-4s on the ULA Vulcan apparently need some work too. But here it goes, and booster separation time. And off they go. And we await launch escape system jettison. Off that goes. So, all right, we are set as far as those staging events are concerned, and then the core is expended, just short of orbit, maybe 1,000 meters per, se per second left, and we go to the upper stage, which is a hydrogen-oxygen stage, 200 kilonewtons, but importantly, only has two ignitions. So, we're using one ignition to complete orbit here. And then we need to use another ignition to transfer. And so here we are time warping to the transfer point. But then we can't use the remaining delta V in the stage in order to capture around the moon or anything like that. It would have enough left over that if we didn't have boil off, we could use it to capture around the moon. But we can't do that because of the engine ignition limits. So we separate the spacecraft from the second stage there. And uh, the thing is, we're a little bit tight on Delta V like this. And well, you can see we have 722 as I extend the solar panels. And so I decide that instead of going to the moon with this currently uncrewed vessel, uh, we would just do a re-entry test with it. And so that is what we're setting up here. The initial burn was to avoid the moon, but we were basically at a moon-like apoapsis. And here I'm just setting my periapsis to the right point, separating off the service module, and then we will do the re-entry test. Because I had previously tested the Gaganyan spacecraft uh, from low Earth orbit, but I hadn't tested it from this very high orbit. And of course, the real thing probably would not be able to do it. It depends on how they deal with the heat shield. Uh, but it is fairly light on this heat shield surface area, so it's a toss-up, uh, technically speaking. But anyway, here we go. We splash down. The goal of the spacecraft launch was to bring some of the crew at our lunar gateway back home. So here I've got uh, AJ-10190, and we fill up the service module with more fuel so we can actually use it. So this would be heavier for the second stage, but that way we use up the second stage. So we launch again. So yeah, uh, we had previously sent a lunar starship to dock with the lunar gateway, but that lunar starship accidentally had crew on board. And that's a lot of crew to supply at the lunar gateway. And I wanted to bring some of them back. So we're sending this Gaganyan spacecraft uncrewed to the lunar gateway to bring three Kerbals back. Now, unfortunately, I when I was replacing things, I apparently put that on the wrong node. So we decouple it using its custom decoupler, but it just sort of hangs out because the propellant was used up. So now we've got a issue. <laughs> we have to sort of dodge the launch escape system here as we separate from the core stage to Vulcan first stage. So off that goes. And this whole thing needs to sort of sidestep here. But we managed that, and we had a lot of time to apoapsis anyway. So here we go, sneaking past, taking our time. 
We could be more violent about it, but this is for the best. And with that, we can ignite the CE-20 engine and finish orbit. And that leaves us with just about enough to actually transfer to the moon. And that is what we do. And then we are actually a little bit shy at the end. So we had to complete the burn with our spacecraft engine on the service module. But it has plenty of Delta V right now for that burn, capturing around the moon, and the entire rendezvous. So all is well. I took advantage of the fact that I gave that service module extra space since very little, little of it was being taken up by the propellant as the Gagayan spacecraft is actually configured. Uh, so I figured we could potentially put larger tanks in there, depending on what they're actually, uh, what they actually have in there. Anyway, we are docking. It took a little bit of rotation. That those type supports, the CX Aerospace docking ports are always finicky, and we'll have further trouble with them later in the video. But I transferred a crew onto the Gaganyan spacecraft, and they are headed back home. These are just random Kerbals. These are not any of the tourists, not any of my viewers who chose to visit the Lunar Gateway or anything like that. Uh, they just snuck on board. They, they were hitchhikers on board a lunar starship. And so this is the burn back home. Not a very big burn because, of course, uh, Lunar Gateway is in a very high orbit, so it's easy to escape lunar gravity here. While we're on our way back, I get a message that we have oxygen running out on one of our other missions. This is a surface lander on the moon and so I decided to go visit that and it just needed updating. Uh, it was using the simple logistics and TAC Life Support doesn't understand the simple logistics thing so we just update that but I decided at that point that we should probably get that crew, uh, Raider Nick and also another crew member in the in the habitat that has the regolith on it. We need to get those guys off of the moon. Anyway, but first a resupply vessel that is launching on an energy rocket from Cape Canaveral for some reason. We do still after all have quite a few Kerbals on board the Lunar Gateway plus Lunar Starship. And so rather than do another mission to bring more back, I decided to send supplies over to it. And as usual, I'm using a modified HTV on this Lunar Modified energy Rocket, Straight Stack energy Rocket an upper stage. Off go the boosters and the core continues and we have to manage our uh, ascent a little bit here. Uh, we had a lot of vertical speed it turns out and I only appreciated that late. Sometimes it's because I'm talking with the live stream people so anyway off goes the first stage on a disposal orbit note and the second stage completes orbit and then manages to transfer to the moon. While that's on its way, the Gaganyan spacecraft returned and it is time for its entry into Earth's atmosphere and so we knock off the service module and here it comes. We are comforted by the fact that we have tested this out previously. Off goes the aerocap. And it looks like the parachutes are imbalanced though, so that's odd. But anyway, they work, and we are down, and our Kerbals are back. Now this is actually the next stream, and unfortunately I was not able to get the audio from this stream. And so it'll be briefly silent, And but we continue our activities. It's just straight on from where we left off, and so the HTV is now rendezvousing with the Lunar Gateway in order to supply it. And we have to deal with the horrible docking ports. I mean, it's fancy that they are rotationally dependent. It's just uh, annoying in this particular case sometimes. There we go. So, all right, that's all supplied. Now, uh, it occurred to me that somebody had complained a while back uh, that it's solar system tourism, but we keep going to the moon. You do have to take into consideration that our trips are dependent on what our, the viewers can pay for, right? And so there's high demand for the less pricey destinations like the moon and Mars. And 
not as much demand for places like Mercury, which is where this is going to, to further facilitate the return of Arthur and Katak from Mercury, right? And there's that capture at 13,000 meters per second, but uh, very few viewers can afford a Mercury mission. So we have to keep that in mind. That's why we have so many activities around the moon. I had wanted to make a lunar lander with the Gaganyan spacecraft, but it occurred to me that there was no hatch on that model, so we couldn't do the job I intended with it. So we had to use the advanced Mark I lander can. Advanced because in RO it puts two people in and sizes that can up, the stock uh, lander can. And we are launching it on a Unix heavy rocket that is a Raptor heavy, I guess you could call it, but uh, the core has fewer engines, it's not nine. The boosters have nine engines, but the core uh, put fewer engines because we were going to expend the core anyway. But uh, otherwise, uh, sort of a Raptor Heavy rocket or a analogy to Falcon Heavy here. And off goes the fairing. And so we're sending this lander over to retrieve Raider Nick and the other Kerbal at that base. And it uses a special engine. It's the, uh, it's the Raider Nick Special, which is appropriate. Here we are capturing with the upper stage of the Unix rocket. The Raider Nick Special was a modification on the RD502 engine that Glushko proposed uh, in his love of really toxic and horrible propellants. Uh, the, this modification on the RD504 has beryllium, lithium, ammonia, fluorine, and pentaborine. It's a five propellant engine. Unfortunately, on this first attempt to use it, I uh, underestimated what periapsis we could survive at around the moon, and I did not compensate for that in time, and so we smacked into a hill. So, yeah. Well, so we had to try again. Uh, well, so there goes the five propellant engine. But yeah, you can see the beryllium fluoride, lithium fluoride. I verified this in RPA light, which is a program to calculate rocket engine uh, stats. And it did not like this combination of propellants. I had to finagle it uh, somewhat to get reasonable numbers, but I did get reasonable numbers. The there, It's not more efficient than hydrogen and oxygen, uh, but the propellants are denser, so you can manage with a smaller tank. And that's why this little lander with its small tank manages to have quite a lot of delta V. Now, the problem is that the Radio Nick Special only has uh, five ignitions and no throttling. So these engines that we have firing right now are actually uh, lunar Gemini lander engines, the infamous Gemini lander engines that are the solution to everything in Kerbal Space Program. They do throttle, they are small, and they have storable propellants. So we have the Erizine and NTO for those and those are what we use to actually land. And unfortunately, um, we could have done a better job on that landing. Uh, but as it turns out, we uh, encountered an interesting phenomena thanks to that, as uh, bits explode, including the main engine on the lander, though we had one of the GLEs left. And the thing is, the lander started breakdancing, basically. It kept going like this. It kept going like this for a while. And uh, I kept some of that in the video, but uh, let me see, how long was it? I mean, it's it's been more than a minute. It's, it's still going. I don't know what's causing it. Uh, I will confess that the solar panels are mine. They're from the Gaganyan spacecraft, actually. I kept those on this lander, uh, but yeah. Yeah, that, that was a while that it decided to break dance for, and I wasn't able to just leave it be or anything because it was still in movement, so we had to backtrack, which I guess we wanted to do anyway. So it allowed us to backtrack, and I was able to make a proper landing without relaunching the whole thing, and this time I was very careful. The reason why I was trying for like a suicide burn or something last time was to make sure we had enough propellant to get back to orbit and to rendezvous with Mir, which is where our Kerbals from these two locations are going to end up. So here we have the regolith hab, and our Kerbal from it will go ahead and board the new lander with difficulty. Um, 
it, it's sort of awkward. I, I guess I should have put some ladder rungs right there or something, but had a little bit of trouble getting in. Rear Nick left his red-nosed lander. Uh, I, I don't know whether that could have potentially gotten back to orbit on its own. I don't think so. I think there must have been a lack of ignitions or something. Anyway, so we got him in and off we go for a rendezvous to Mir. And really, uh, just accounting for the fuel with the Raider Nick special engine, I don't know what else to call it. It is a Glushko Bureau modified RD-502, but I don't know what that was supposed to be called. So it's just the Raider Nick special now. Uh, with the Mark I uh, lander can, of course, there's only one actual IVA slot. So the fact that Realism Overhaul created this advanced one that was sized up and put two seats is all nice, but we only get one portrait anyway because the IVA view still only has one position. So Raider Nick's in there, but his portrait's not showing up. All right, so here we are docking with Mir. And there we go. So that's all done. And I let my viewers feast on this view of Mir around the moon at the end of that live stream. And on to the next stream where I transfer Raider Nick and the other Kerbal onto Mir and deorbit this lander because the Raider Nick special engine is now out of ignition. It only has five ignitions, so this lander is basically useless. It also lacks any of its five propellants, and we're not going to ship those five propellants over. I also decided to deorbit an HTV that was out of its supplies. I moved all the supplies over. There were supplies left, but I moved them over into the station, and so we deorbited that, and so cleared some docking ports like that. Here I'm outfitting a large supply vessel with extra tanks and we are sending this to the ISS actually. And I'm doing so on a New Glenn rocket. This one doesn't have the fins or anything because I was intending to expand the first stage anyway. So we're max payload here. I wanted to send as much supplies to the International Space Station as possible in order to not have to send more supplies <laughs> basically. I mean, of course, we could have used a heavier launcher to do it, but um, this seemed to be okay. An okay amount of time that it would give us before the next time I had to resupply. So, off go the fairings, and there's the supply vessel. And... Orbit. There we go. Alright, so we push off with the HTV resupply vessel. I think that's an AJ-10-190 on the tail. Handling all the orbital burns, probably carrying some extra propellant over to the station as well. I think that's what the other tanks with. Well, we've got the UDMH and NTO you see there. That's not used by the AJ-10-190. Those are extra propellants for the station. Especially, uh, obviously, the Russian side there. So, we send off the old HTV, which will deorbit. As you can see, it only has a little bit of propellants, enough to get itself on a suborbital path. And then the new HTV takes its slot. All very nice and smooth, especially because these are not the CX Aerospace docking ports I always have trouble with. These are just uh, reconfigured stock docking ports. Though sometimes they cause me problems. And is this one of those? Yes, this is one of those times. Okay, yes, yeah, uh, they're causing me problems because they they don't have any magnetism and realism overhaul the docking ports are just They just they're really not magnetic. So uh, You have to get it all very precise. And, you know, th it looks pretty close together But there's just a little bit of a gap there. Maybe a little bit of a rotation that needs to happen and A little bit of a shift one way Can we get it there please. Uh, okay, well anyway, yes, that docked. And I decided to bring back two Kerbals, and we were using this already docked Dragon Vessel to do that. And so the return of this Dragon Vessel. And here we are going through re-entry. But to my dismay, the parachutes did not operate properly. 
Now, previously, I had operated the parachutes without opening the nose cone. They are sort of tucked in there, but they used to work, but this time they didn't, and we ended up surviving thanks to an ablative heat shield. I don't know how that works either, but hey, the Kerbals, the Kerbals made it. <laughs> that's, that's the important part. So, next up, we have the pair, my very special nuclear-powered spacecraft, meant for a proton rocket, but here we have a heavily modified proton rocket. This is a proton first stage with a Nuglin second stage. Now, the pair is 6.6 .6 meters, so even, on, even in this regular situation on a regular proton rocket, the fairing looks very weird, but we went all all Delta 3 on this. Well, it's worse because in between the slots on the protons sort of, I don't know what you want to call those, um, I slipped six AJ-60s. These are the boosters, the old boosters from the Atlas V. So, yeah, we took advantage of those spaces and created something truly monstrous. Or if you're a Delta 3 fan, beautiful, especially when it rips apart. Because <laughs> Delta 3's they, they, uh, the most successful rocket ever. As it turns out, the pair uh, also has an ablative bottom that helps it to survive. Uh, the fact that it's a nuclear engine might not be the best thing. Heat shields seem a little bit better. But yeah, that engine is actually an RD-0410. It was a real engine that the Soviets made, but I don't think they ever considered it crash-proofing. <laughs> but here we are. It's one of those days. Well, it's not really one of those days. It's one of those few days. Maybe De uh, it was December, actually, that these streams were done. And apparently December is good for the, for the survival. At least in Kerbal. But anyway, here this time we did not flip out, thankfully. It does have incredibly high thrust weight ratio off the pad, so that was the problem before. And I overestimated how much I could turn. But this time we managed it, and so there's the end of the first stage. And separation. But it, it wasn't the the fairing, the interstage fairing node that separated. It was just the top of the first stage. And so, yeah, we had a little bit of a staging error there. Thankfully, the engines, the two BE-3Us, burned through the interstage fairing. And we flipped around and started going the right way again. And off go the fairings, and there is the pair. So, here we are completing orbit. Not quite as efficiently as I originally intended, though. Uh, we lost some Delta V on that flip. And as a result, the pair had to finish its transfer over to the moon. So this had the ability to transfer the pair over to the moon without the pair actually using any of its Delta V on its own. But not that that was necessary. The pair, as you can see, has 7,000 meters per second. It can transfer the moon, capture around the moon, rendezvous with something, and then return, and then capture back around Earth. So, yeah, the I, I don't know why we need to go to such lengths, but here we are. And the pair is going to dock with Lunar Gateway in order to, in the future, bring some other Kerbals back. Because, again, we still have like 12 Kerbals on Lunar Gateway. So here it is, making further rendezvous burns. Sometimes I forget to put the MLI layers on the pair and the liquid hydrogen boils off mightily. I don't think this is one of those times. So here's the rendezvous as we approach Lunar Gateway. And we uh, remove an HTV and bring in the pair to that docking port. The Lunar Gateway had enough space for the supplies anyway, so we didn't need to keep the HTV. We will need some more docking ports on this thing, and I will add a docking module later on. Now, as the pair comes into dock, we uh, we end up having some problems, again, due to the rotational requirements of these CX aerospace docking ports, I think. But basically, the station itself starts to rotate, and you know that's not a good thing, so we have to back away. Nothing broke, nothing broke. 
but we stabilized the station and then tried again this time a little bit more carefully and so with the docking of the pair here we made sure to extend the active side properly before closing the deal with the docking of the pair, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.